one second. I'm having a bit of a technical issue here. Um, so 2020, I think it's safe to say, uh, has been an unusual year so far for everybody around the world. Learning looks a little bit different right now. That's, uh, that's me teaching my class there. And uh, before 2020, before this really atypical year we've had, there was already an explosion of data becoming available about learners and learning. And as learning needs to move online, the data becoming available increases considerably. So even before uh, this year started, we had a ton of online data. We now have just a lot more. A lot of this data occurs as learners use interactive learning environments of various sorts. And here you see a few different uh, interactive learning environments uh, used by adult learners. Starting at the top left, you see the, um, the Alex system, which figures out where a student is in a progression of skills and uh, offers them content on the skill they next need. At the top, you see the transfer uh, without an E, T-R-A-N-S-F-R environment which is a virtual reality environment, much like the one that we just saw a minute ago, <clears throat> uh, which uh, in this case, it's a bartending environment and helps people learn uh, skills involved in bartending. Top right, you see a uh, lecture video from a massive online open course. Bottom left, <clears throat> you see a image from um, VMedic, which is a system that trains uh, medics who are often in battlefield situations for the US Army and other militaries how to conduct uh, how to conduct first aid and first response activities in a situation where there might be physical danger to the medic. Bottom right, uh, the Cold Stone Creamery um, has used a training environment that is a game, a gamified training environment. So there's this wide range of different types of interactive learning environments these days, ranging from the rather traditionalist, uh, massive online open courses with videos and uh, quizzes to virtual reality and game and gameplay. And these kind of environments create uh, these kind of environments create a great deal of log data uh, into, when they're done right, tracking everything a student does. And sometimes they're not done right. And sometimes the data is messy. Uh, this is an example of some pretty messy data right here to take a look at. Um, so we're collecting data. What do we do with all that data to benefit our learners, our trainees, and to support instructors? People have been asking that question in a systematic fashion for about 15 years. Uh, two scientific societies, the International Educational Data Mining Society, which I uh, co-founded, uh, I guess it was now 12 years ago, um, and it's now in the leadership of other hands. Uh, it's moved on through a generational transition. Um, no, no presidents for life in the scientific society. And the Society for Learning Analytics Research are both working on this topic. <clears throat> With the goals, the joint goals of exploring the big data now available on learners and learning, for several goals, to promote new scientific discoveries and advance the science of learning. That's kind of what I'm wearing my, you know, kind of academic professor hat. To better assess learners along multiple dimensions, and to provide better real-time support for learners, leading to genuinely individualized instruction. So it's not just, the, the goal of this community isn't just to develop scientific findings, but is to develop information that can be useful for instructors and for intervening in real time. Now, there's a lot of types of educational data mining method. I'll briefly refer to um, uh, a few categories that I, have written about in collaboration with Colleen Iasef and George Siemens. The first of those um, is prediction, where one develops a model where you can infer a single aspect of the data, the predicted variable, from some combination of other aspects of the data, the predictor variables. This also corresponds to independent and dependent, but I think it's a little clearer to think about it in what are you predicting and what are you predicting it from? <clears throat> and people have used this kind of technology <clears throat> to answer questions like, which learners are bored? Which learners are gonna fail the class they're in? Which learners are gonna quit the training program they're in without completing it? And even if people complete, even if people pass the class, in some ways, in a, especially in an e-learning setting, really, in all learning, we should care about this. Which learners aren't actually gonna be able to demonstrate the skill in real world tasks? Doesn't matter if people complete your training course and all is said and done. Doesn't matter whether they uh, get a great grade, 
What matters is, do they actually learn it? Can they actually use it? So the goal of prediction is broadly to infer something that matters so that we can do something about it. Second big category is structure discovery. Find structure and patterns in the data that emerge naturally. So whereas in prediction modeling, we're trying to find a specific thing, in structure discovery, we're trying to find out just what falls out of the data. There's no specific target or predictor variable. So it's things like, let's say you have one set of activities, a curriculum. Are there groups of students who approach that same curriculum differently? And let's say you have a discussion forum. Which students develop more social relationships there? <clears throat> Third major category is relationship mining. Discovering relationships between variables in a data set with a lot of variables. <clears throat> so for example, if you have a set of courses or learning objects or so on, are there some trajectories that are more effective than others? If students are naturally taking different trajectories for whatever reason, you can look and say, does material A before material B work better than material B before material A? Relatedly, which aspects of the design of learning systems have implications for student engagement? Uh, for example, you can look at um, if there's lots of questions or prompts in your system, you can look at the linguistic features of them. Uh, if there's other ways that it varies, perhaps the way the videos are designed, you can look at that. There's a lot of applications <coughs> excuse me, four that I think are particularly key. First one is prediction of student success or failure. Um, and that can manifest itself, as I mentioned before, a minute ago in a lot of ways. Second one is automatically detecting uh, whether a learner has learned, whether they're engaged, what their emotion is, their strategy for better individualization. A third one, informing instructors, managers, and other stakeholders about what's going on. And a fourth, again, basic scientific discovery, which promotes in the long term better learning. A key element of e-learning in these days in every context, workplace and beyond, is adaptive learning, making learning that can adapt to individuals. And that requires three things. First, determining something meaningful about the student. Second, knowing what matters, determining the right thing. And third, doing the right thing about it. We'll talk about each of those in turn. <clears throat> so first, determining something about the student. So there's been quite a bit of successful work and what has been achieved in academic projects still outstrips what's available at scale commercially today. And I'll be kind of doing just a quick run through of some of what's out there to give you all you folks an idea of what can be done. So learning. Has the learner learned the current skill? That's like the most basic question we can ask. And people have been working on it since the mid 90s and we're pretty good at answering that now. Not perfect and it depends on what kind of skill we're looking at. But for simple straightforward skill, things where there's a right answer and a wrong answer and it's easy to recognize, we're pretty good at telling if someone's learned. Where in the learning sequence is the student? So um, if you have like a trajectory of activities, uh, maybe say this is most obvious, in, for example, in K-12 mathematics, where there's just this order and prerequisite structure of mathematics. But it also shows up, for example, in a lot of workplace tasks. You can't um, do, you can't put together certain equipment until you understand various aspects of it. So there's kind of a part whole aspect. And in that sequence, where is the student? Another one is, is the student wheel spinning, making no or minimal progress? Um, in one project I was involved in, we uh, found evidence that an adaptive learning system, and I'll in that case use adaptive in the weakest of senses, basically would, if a student didn't get things, if a student didn't get it right, the system would serve more content on the same thing to the student. And it would just keep serving the same content. And so one student got 148 exercises on a skill wrong in a row. Now that's a very persistent student and a very broken system, but the fact is that if we can tell that a student has gotten it wrong after 10 tries, even eight, even five maybe, we probably shouldn't be continuing to give them the same thing. We should pop that up to an instructor, pop that up to somebody who can take action to figure out why that person's not learning it. Um, so wheel spinning is really important to detect and increasingly in the last seven, eight years, people have been able to do so. Complex learning. So I mentioned a minute ago, right, wrong answers. And a lot of e-learning out there is focused on content that has a right answer and a wrong answer. But what about more complex problems? So Sao Pedro and also in my work with uh, Clark Majura and other projects, people have been able to make models that can infer 
if a student is learning to solve complex problems that require inquiry. In that case, it's not measuring the correctness of the final answer, it's measuring the correctness of the process. And we can do that. Uh, in other work by uh, folks uh, around the country and around the world, detecting whether the student's developing rich conceptual understanding from their behavior. So in cases, for example, uh, Rowe looked at physics and computational thinking. And in that work, Rowe was able to show that when students playing a game played it one certain way, it reflected one type of physics understanding. When they played another way, it reflected a different kind of conceptual understanding. <clears throat> Robust learning. Um, so I don't know who here has used a flashcard app for learning a foreign language or for some other purpose, but they've gotten really advanced in the last few years. And what they can do is they can actually forecast whether a student will remember what they learned and give them the practice and the timing of the practice that will optimize the likelihood that their learning will be robust. We often do training, and my university does training, and uh, I get my day of, uh, well, my hour of training on how to drive a car. And, um, and of course, it tells me all these things about using my mirrors, and I forget about it afterwards. Um, alternatively, is the student prepared for future learning? If we're trying to teach somebody something that is going to be built on by all these later things, then we don't want to just teach them once and say, all right, they've learned it. We want to say, it's not even enough to say, have they learned it? We have to say, are they prepared to learn the next topic in the sequence? And that has a lot to do with how people learn. <clears throat> Metacognition. Increasingly, e-learning systems can infer things like, is the student confident? <clears throat> Does the student ask for help when they need it? Learning when to ask for help and when it's useful is really essential. Um, is the student persisting in the face of challenge? I mentioned a few minutes ago wheel spinning, right? Like, we don't want a student to persist indefinitely and make no progress, but we also don't want to develop somebody who never tries when they hit the first roadblock. So there's this fine ground of catching productive persistence and differentiating it from unproductive persistence. And there's actually been a lot of progress in that in the last few years. Disengaged behaviors. How can somebody learn if they're not even trying to learn? So behaviors like gaming the system, where a student will systematically try to subvert the e-learning system they're using to make progress without learning. And um, you might think this is just a thing that kids do. Like, you know, they might like have a system that has multiple hints and they'll go hint, 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 type the answer. Hint, 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 type the answer. Uh, or systematically guess. One time I was standing behind a middle schooler as they typed one and it was wrong two, and it was wrong, three, and it was wrong, four, five, six, seven, all the way to 38, which was the answer. So you might think that's the way this behavior manifests, but in fact, actually, in all of our research, the population that most does it is medical residents learning to diagnose cancer. They're busy adults. The training they're receiving may be important for their long term, but it's not relevant to what they have to do today on the job, and so they just blow through it as quickly as possible. One case we even saw was a case where uh, a colleague of mine found that somebody had blinded themselves um, using a laser control system. And when they went back to the data, they found that this individual had actually gamed the system during the materials to train them how to use it safely. So um, being able to determine that somebody is disengaged and being able to do something about it is really key because it really can have uh, serious consequences. Carelessness more generally. Carelessness distinguished from gaming the system. In gaming the system, you're really trying to avoid learning as, as much as you can. In carelessness, you're not trying to avoid learning so much as just not putting in the full effort. So a learner might make a dumb mistake, and if we can catch that, we may be able to do something about it, get them back on track. <clears throat> Affect, emotion and context. Systems these days can detect whether a learner is bored, frustrated, confused, in a state of engaged concentration. Uh, that's the state, it's associated with Csikszentmihalyi's idea of flow where you're so engrossed in what you're doing that you can't focus on anything else but that. And it's the state that I'm sure you're all in right at this moment. You know, one of the, one of the sad things about the new era of keynotes is I can't tell if any of you laughed at my joke. For all I know, it totally bombed. Going on. So, thank you. You don't need uh, physical sensors uh, to do this kind of stuff. People often want to put physical sensors in, 
um, you know, cameras and galvanic skin response bracelets and posture chairs um, and all those things. But you can infer, you know, those are useful. They, they make your models better, but you don't need them. Everything I talked about today, you can infer solely from student interaction with an e-learning system. How do we develop these as a field? Well, first we obtain some indicator of ground truth. Um, so some indicator of here's our evidence that this thing was occurring, at least for some subset of learners. Maybe it's existing data on student quitting or failure of performance. Maybe it's tests we give on how robust learning is or whether people retain it over time. Maybe we ask people what their emotions are. Um, <clears throat> maybe we annotate log data by hand for strategy or behavior. Um, one approach that my lab has used a lot historically, it turns out to be really efficient, really powerful, really high quality data, is actually going out to learning settings, whether they be in workplace learning settings or in K-12, and actually watch people and take field notes. That's a little less relevant in this particular historical moment. We're gonna to have to probably not use that for the next year, um, but, but um, or at least not in places, not in North America. Maybe uh, if anyone here is from New Zealand, you folks have done really well with handling COVID and you probably could use field observation. We can't in North America at the moment, um, but it turns out to be a really good one. The point is though, get some indicator that what you're looking for is there for some subset. And what you're gonna do is use that data to build a model that will apply to totally new learners. So use data mining to find log data indicators that co-occur with that ground truth. I don't know what happened there. Um, you distill features of interaction hypothesized to correlate to the desired construct. Um, it turns out that a combination of theoretical understanding and automated discovery works better than pure automated discovery. I, I still believe that. Uh, it's an ongoing debate within machine learning right now. Um, and you input that into a standard data mining or machine learning algorithm. We don't use any fancy secret sauce in my lab in terms of algorithms. Um, the stuff that's off the shelf is just so good these days. Our secret sauce is in distilling the data into things that can go into the machine learning based on theory. Next step, and this is really key, <clears throat> is to test the model generalizability. Um, relevant in its small way to uh, um, events in the wider world, you can't just build a model on a convenience population and expect it to work for everybody. And there's real serious equity issues when you do that. Um, there's a unfortunately long history, even, even in the last, I can't say long history, but there is a lot of history. My colleagues, Luke Paquette, Jacqueline Okampa, Alexis Andres and I, <clears throat> published a paper uh, just in the last month in the Journal of Educational Data Mining showing that this issue is really being ignored by the community. But when you build a model on a convenience population, which convenience population typically means upper middle class, majority racial group, um, when you do that, it typically doesn't work as well on a more diverse population. You have to have diversity in the samples or the model won't have equity. So in K-12, we've determined over the years that it's important to build models and test their transfer across rural, urban, and suburban schools and between both English as a second language and non-English as a second language learners. In universities and adult learners, there's less clear evidence. Um, two of my students, Miguel Andres and Alexis Andres, have been working on a demonstration that's not yet published that seems to show that when you build model, when you build a model on data from learners from the United States for adult learners, uh, it doesn't work as well on learners from other countries. And in particular, um, developing countries, models built on developed countries tend to work poorly in developing countries. And uh, specifically, developing countries don't tend to look all that similar to each other, though there are some regional variations where it looks like models built in the Middle East and North Africa tend to transfer between countries. But the point being, you can't just have a convenient sample and expect the model to work on all your learners. <clears throat> so second issue, you've determined something about the student, you've got a great model of something, but now you've got to know what matters and ideally know what matters so that you determine the right thing about the student. So let me give you an example. Consider the students taking an advanced massive online open course on data science and education. Um, big data and education, my own MOOC. Uh, I use the data from my own teaching to learn about my teaching, to learn about education in general. 
Um, so this course had a mixture, has an ongoing mixture of graduate students, university faculty, school administrators and teachers, information technology workers, and data scientists. We've determined that student interaction within this course can predict whether the student will eventually submit a scientific paper in the field. And in specific, forum lurkers, people who read everything but don't post much, are more likely to submit a scientific paper than people who post in the forums. I'll pause for a second there because that's really kind of surprised the heck out of us. There's a long literature in e-learning showing that if you post a lot to discussion forums, you're more likely to complete the course. And that was true in our course. The students who posted more were more likely to complete and less likely to use the knowledge compared to students who just read everything. And that's really striking because it shows that our intuitions are often wrong. And if you ask a subtly wrong question, you get a subtly wrong answer. <clears throat> so those of you who are taking massive online open courses, if your goal is to learn from it, don't worry so much about posting on the forums, just make sure you read stuff. Another example, this one um, not from a workforce context, adult context. Student knowledge and specific disengaged behaviors in middle school math, we're talking 11 year olds, 12 year olds, predicts end of year tests. Okay, that's not surprising. It predicts college admission five years later. If you're less disengaged in middle school math, you're less likely, you're, sorry, if you're less disengaged in middle school math, you're more likely to go to college. It predicts college major. If you are more disengaged in math when you're 11, you're less likely to major in math or science when you're 20. And it even predicts first job after college. If you are disengaged, if you get careless when you're 11, if you game the system when you're 11, it predicts being less likely to take a job in a STEM industry after college. So this is one of these indicators that some of these, these things we see, you wouldn't think, we didn't think that carelessness was gonna matter that much. We thought that carelessness was a minor issue, something that you could kind of tell the kid, be careful, and kids could learn to be careful, and it wouldn't be a big deal. But carelessness has more than 10 years of predictive value for determining what people are really deeply interested in. So <clears throat> that's a sign that some of these indicators we see that look small actually are connecting to something big. So let's say we know something about the learner and we know it matters. How do we do the right thing? It's really hard to do the right thing. <clears throat> so what do we do when we know a student's bored or we know their gaming system or we know they have shallow learning that won't prepare them to go forward? There's a huge space of potential interventions we can do. Um, one category is automated interventions delivered by animated agents. On the left, you see Steve who figures out when students are struggling to understand uh, how to operate a, a control panel and uses gestures and pointing to walk them through the process. In the middle, you see MathSpring, a system for younger learners that mirrors the emotions of learners to make them feel understood, to help them stick with difficult material. And on the right, you see Scooter, who um, is a puppy character who looks happy when students use the software appropriately and gets angry when they don't. Here's an image of Rex from the system Inkits used for middle school science. Now, Inkits is a simulation system and Rex interacts with students while they use it. So Inkits can recognize that a student doesn't understand the process they're using here. And one reason why I'm giving this example today is because even though this is a middle school example, this kind of learning a process is a very common thing in uh, e-learning in the workforce. <clears throat> so, and to quickly answer the thing on the window, yeah, FET does not do that. Um, so Rex has determined that the student is not demonstrating a proper process. They're not able to design a control experiment. And Rex says, hey, I noticed this. Um, and do you just want to go on and keep trying, or do you want me to explain it to you? Um, or let's say the student becomes disengaged and just starts playing with the buttons. Then Rex says, hey, are you just playing with the buttons? Take your learning seriously or I will eat you. And I point out this one also because it's kind of funny. I, again, I couldn't hear if anyone laughed. But the idea that a computer agent will eat you is funny, and that humor can sometimes help to re-engage learners. That's something we've known about going back years, back to Roz Picard's uh, seminal work on emotion and the use of computers. 
Another category of intervention, messages to learners. So Janine DeFalco uh, noticed that many learners using, um, many learners in the US Army who are using the depicted uh, game to learn how to do first aid in battlefield situations, they were becoming frustrated because it, it's actually a very difficult game. VMatic is really difficult. It's designed to be difficult. It's designed to be very frustrating. Um, like sometimes the patient dies no matter what you do, and that's real life. It's meant to train people for that situation. But some learners get so frustrated that they can't persist. And so she tried the um, she tried the, the initiative of having messages. If students get frustrated, it gives messages between simulations that remind the learner of um, kind of their their key role as a member of the military, as a member of the team, if you were and what that should mean to them. And these messages reduce learner frustration and improve learning outcomes. <clears throat> Stealth interventions. These kind of interventions change learner experiences in subtle ways, in ways that the learner can't see and I can't show you a picture of. So one example would be mastery learning. It's a little more obvious, but it's still kind of largely invisible. You keep the student working until you on a topic until you think they know it. An even subtler one would be adjusting the difficulty. So for example, let's say we see a learner becoming frustrated. It may be appropriate in that situation to dial down the difficulty for a couple exercises in various ways. Get them kind of feel like they're making progress again and then move them back to the harder stuff. <clears throat> reports. We can give reports to instructors, to managers, the learners themselves. Top left, you see the, the skillometer from Cognitive Tutor which uh, gives a report that both instructors and learners can see about what their progress is. On the right side, top right, you see uh, Civitas's reports for um, kind of basically um, dean level reports, um, which are for kind of higher level folks who wanna see how things are going at a high level. At the bottom, um, you can see reports for instructors from the transfer system which are telling the instructors for each of their learners on each module um, how much they've attempted, how much they've quit without making progress, how often they're wheel spinning, uh, how much better students are getting, and how long they're spending. This is very valuable information for an instructor then to say, oh, this learner is wheel spinning on this module. I should email them and have a conversation about what they're struggling with, rather than just letting them struggle indefinitely. <clears throat> Here's um, Another type of this um, communication to and from instructors, one thing that people um, have been starting to experiment with is the idea of building in systems that queue up emails for instructors to send to students so that it's from the instructor and the instructor can still edit it, but it gives uh, kind of some support for the instructor because anyone here who has taught a large group of learners at the same time or an ongoing group of learners knows that you can't actually always look through the data every single day. But if there's a system that every day queues up, oh, here's an email you might want to send. And you look at it and you, it, it kind of supports the instructor in doing it. On Task Learning is a system out of Australia, um, originally developed at the University of Southern Australia uh, and University of Sydney that does some of that. <clears throat> Analyzing what content is working well and poorly. So increasingly folks, uh, these reports from e-learning aren't just for the instructors or the learners, but they're for the content developers. And so, for example, um, using an automated model to determine, is there some content that's learning being learned slowly? Or are there unexpected patterns in student errors that tell us that maybe there's something weird about our content? One example, um, my, my colleagues and I were able to actually take a huge set of instructional videos and look at learner progress um, associated with them. Like, did the learner actually get better after them? And um, we were able to see which were some of the best videos and which were some of the worst videos and pass this information on to the content team. The worst videos need to be fixed. The best videos, we can learn what we did there and try to emulate that. Another example, the transfer system uh, provides content authors data on which content is harder and more time consuming for students. So that they can say, oh gosh, this one unit took three times as long as all the other ones. That might make sense. Maybe it's a unit that really is time consuming inherently by the material, but maybe there's something we're doing wrong. So as I mentioned, there's a huge space of things we can do, and I hope I've given some good examples. It's still an open area for the field, 
and it's an area for cons of considerable ongoing research for my lab. <clears throat> Where is this kind of stuff used? In K-12, it's used a lot. In undergraduate, it's used somewhere. In graduate education, it's used rarely. In professional learning, it's used rarely. So this is an opportunity for enterprising people on this call, and I'd be happy to have conversations with folks. Kind of, there's no in the hallway conversation, but feel free to uh, Google me and email me, and I'd be happy to chat with you about how this might be useful in your own endeavors. So there's a lot of potential. There's also a lot of snake oil out there, and I wanna say it's been a few minutes talking about that now. Here are some considerations for getting it right. <clears throat> First of all, in-house or external? If you hire talent to do analytics or data mining, <clears throat> try to find at least one team member who has expertise in the type of data you're working with. Not all data is the same, and what you do with your models isn't always the same. You wouldn't hire an education researcher like me to conduct a medical trial or manage your stock portfolio. I mean, really, don't. And similarly, don't just hire people with expertise in financial data or bioinformatics to be your educational data mining team. It doesn't work well. Um, there's hilarious stories of large, I could tell a story of um, a large education provider that I bet most people here have heard of who hired a bioinformatics guy from Stanford to lead their data science team. And they spent, they, st they put up a blog and for six months they put up all the new things they were discovering, which invariably then in the comment thread below turned out to be something that was done in the 50s but had been done much better back then or something that had been written up and heavily saved for the last 20 years and it really became quite an embarrassment for them and it's not just the embarrassment imagine all the wasted resources in having this person rediscover um, mathematical models from the 1950s problem is even now there still aren't enough people with the expertise in educational data to go around although I do have some great students looking for jobs. Hybrid teams seem to work. Embedding mentor consultants with expertise seem to work. No domain expertise teams don't work as well. If you go for an outside team, make sure that you know what they're doing and why. Trust me, is simply not good enough for this kind of thing. Um, make sure you collect the data that, to be sure that the approach you're using is working. Do experiments, do quasi experiments. You know, try and say, now that we've switched this new training method, is it better than before? Collect data on things like program completion, job performance, really important that one. Course evals, do people like it? It's not the whole end of it, but it's something. Grades if relevant. Ask students if they feel confident that they can do it. If you feel like you can do it, it doesn't mean you can, if you feel like you can do it, it doesn't mean you can do it. But if you feel like you can't do it, it's a really good sign you probably can't. Indicators of actual participation. Another consideration when hiring external teams, make sure you're getting a solution customized to your needs. Take, for example, the problem of retention analytics. Do people drop out of college? Some vendors build one model once and then they reuse it for every client. Or they build a model with no data at all. They just make stuff up. Um, ideally, an organization should be using a model built and validated on data from their organization. And that, is equally true of like talent analytics, of HR analytics. If that's not possible from the start, then you should ask your vendor to make sure they're giving you a model developed and tested on data from multiple organizations similar to yours. Understanding what the model means. Ideally, you won't just get a prediction out of this fancy um, machine learning model you're getting or a huge number of indicators that you have to just sift through laboriously. You get information on why the system made the prediction it did. Why is a specific learner at risk of poor job performance? Why is this specific curriculum material less effective? Why is a collaborative team less effective? In interpreting this evidence, it's important for the people who are receiving the data in your organization to receive some training in what the indicators mean and the context they occur in. Many indicators are context specific. Give an example. Uh, I did work with uh, Lindrum, Lindrum, and Perkowski, where we looked at whether learners opened an e-textbook, when they opened it, and how they did in a course. And we found that if a learner hadn't opened the e-textbook on the first day of a course, simple indicator, have you opened the e-textbook? If they hadn't done it by the first day of the course, it catches most of the students who fail. Most students who fail haven't opened the textbook, but it also catches a lot of students who won't fail. A lot of students open the textbook on the second day and they're just fine. 
However, same indicator, have you opened the textbook? If you haven't opened the e-textbook on day 14, you almost always fail the course. But a lot of students who fail the course have opened their textbook by then. One simple indicator, totally different meaning on context. So look further. Right now, most of the use of learning analytics is focused on immediate retention. Will the student pass this course? And I really encourage folks here not to think in that terms. I realize that in, e in corporate e-learning, there's probably a little more focus on performance, but I still think there's a lot of just compliance. Go further. Fine-grained behavior now can predict big outcomes later. Participating in a massive online open course can predict whether you participate in the field. Engagement in middle school math can predict college attendance and what job you take. <clears throat> Go as far as you can in tracking outcomes. For example, if I was building an analytics model for predicting retention at Penn, I would want to try to predict who's on track to graduate from Penn, succeed in their career, be a credit to Penn, someday donate lots of money to dear old Penn. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I was meeting with the development office for a minute there. Sorry, wrong slides. So the big idea, thanks to the big data now becoming available on student learning and modern data mining methods, we can make inferences about students in real time. These inferences can be predictive of long-term outcomes. And what it can help us do is to track a student's engagement or knowledge or whatever now, predict the longer-term impact, and intervene to re-engage students and support their learning. Helping e-learning achieve its goals of individualizing to help learners develop their skills and achieve their professional goals and the company's goals. There's lots of challenges, but there's lots of opportunities as well. Before I open the field to questions, I would just like to have a brief, uh, I guess, commercial. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about what I've been talking about today, all of our lab publications are available online. Google Ryan Baker. You can also take our massive online open course, Big Day in Education, running on edX right now. You can sign up for a certificate, but actually because of ongoing funding for this course, we actually have been able to make it possible for you to take it for free as well. So if you don't care about getting a signed certificate um, that says University of Pennsylvania to show your friends, you can take this course and learn everything for, from it for free. Um, also, as well as being able to just get all of our lab publications with kind of a couple months delay, um, if you go to our Twitter and our Facebook feed, they're low traffic, I don't spam your feed, and uh, you will see all of our latest scientific results there. We try to be very active in getting it out to the world. So I look forward to the questions now, and also, again, feel free to reach out to me later, since we can't have a conversation around the uh, water cooler um, or around the buffet table. I'd be happy to have a conversation virtually later with anybody who'd like to. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Great to, great to hear your talk, and we're going to get some questions in just a minute. And the questions are coming in. So maybe we'll start with Renee's question. You <coughs> mentioned snake oil salesmen. This is a field that attracts snake oil salesmen. What's your, she wants to know, uh, what, what, what do you think is the reason behind that? Why are there so many snake oil salesmen in, uh, in this particular field? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that this field has more snake oil salesmen than comparable fields. I think there's a lot of snake oil in the world in general. But I think that in e-learning, there's a couple of reasons why there's a particularly high number, proportion of snake oil, um, why it doesn't get rooted out quickly. I think one is that it, um, one is the people making the decisions about what technologies or platforms to adopt often uh, don't have the expertise to tell the difference. And that's true in the corporate e-learning space, it's true in higher ed, it's true in K-12. Um, <clears throat> it takes specialized knowledge to be able to really determine what's good and what isn't, and most people don't have it and they don't seek it. Um, that allows snake oil to prosper, to grow, and uh, not to really get rooted out the same way. Uh, so I think it really comes down to that. There's some really great stuff. I don't mean to say that it's particularly prone to snake oil, simply that there's a lot of it. Knowing the difference can be hard. Yeah, no, I, I think I've, I agree, totally agree with you that that's true in e-learning overall. You see a lot of decisions that are made and more of a, you know, more based on technology, not really fully by, by always by people who understand learning and goals and performance in the workplace setting and, and what can get you there. Um, 
And it's, and it's tricky. And, you know, there's a lot of marketing to it to sort of sift through. And, you know, everybody says they're effective. Everybody says they do X and Y. And to try to understand what's behind it to, to get to make the right decisions is a, is a challenge. It's a challenge to be an educated audience, especially when sometimes the buyers are not people who are in the field. And, and that gets you in that situation. Right. And when people say their technology is adaptive, you're telling the difference between, say, a group like Alex that has spent a decade refining their approach and using data to improve it versus somebody who just made up their model that af in an afternoon. Like it's almost impossible to tell from the outside unless you actually go look at the peer reviewed papers or lack thereof. Well, I think the marketing spin is that there's nothing more adaptive than just having made up your system that afternoon. But yes, um, I totally, totally, totally agree. <laughs> and I think that it's certainly a concern. I see that sort of everywhere as well. Um, next next question we have with um, from uh, Christoph is, uh, can you point out, do you have some studies that you can point out that focused on workplace learning in particular? So this is clearly relevant, this is the reason we invited you to a conference focused on workplace learning, but do you have any that are that you can speak to that are workplace specific? So I would go so far as to say that 99% of published papers in this field are not workplace. And the reason for that is, is that there's now kind of a push in K-12 and higher ed to have more evidence published, and there's not that same push in the workplace. There's also a concern a lot of the time in, in corporate e-learning that, uh, that their content, that the content is either, is not something they want shared, whether there's worries about proprietariness or embarrassment or whatever. So you will see the occasional corporate learning study. I believe that, for example, Lewis Johnson at Alelo has published some good work along those lines. Um, there is, uh, there's, a scattering here and there. And to some extent, massive online open courses, as Anne Trambor has shown in her doctoral dissertation, are workplace learning. And there's a lot of stuff in MOOCs, but it's often fairly poor at differentiating the workplace context and uses from the, uh, from the more academic uses of it. The, I would like to see more. Um, when I talk to my, fr my friends doing this kind of work in corporate e-learning, there's just not the same incentives or, uh, even when the research is occurring, and I mentioned my colleagues at Transfer, they do some really neat stuff with content improvement using data, but there's no real incentive for them to publish it. So do you have, do you have a suspicion there's a little, I mean, there's not a tremendous amount going on in workplace learning, but there's a little bit more going on, but it doesn't make it out into papers where you can see it publicly. That kind of true of a lot of, you know, we learn design methods too. People do something really, really great, and sometimes it's just internal and no one ever sees it because there isn't the incentive, as you mentioned, to, exactly. to publicize it in any way, shape, or form. So is your suspicion that there might be a little more than, than you know, even you as, as someone who knows, you know, is well aware of everything going on in the field would know? Um, and maybe <clears> that's something to, you know, try to, yeah. I don't know what you know, to get to. That's it. absolutely right. It's absolutely, and actually a lot of what I know, I can't talk about because of NDAs. A lot of the times when companies are doing this stuff, Actually, even if they partner with an academic researcher like me, they put them under an NDA, they don't publish. And so that's why I kind of hesitated in answering that because I actually can think of several examples off the top of my head that I can't tell you about. Yeah, no, I've, I'm, familiar, I'm familiar with the feeling. And that is, you know, and, and that's a big issue. And it's something that I would love to, to find, you know, I understand the, the reason behind it, but it's, we'd love to find a way to address it. There's a lot that just doesn't get out there and the field doesn't continue to grow in some of the ways that it can because people keep things, um, in, internally. Um, next question is an entirely uh, entirely different question, so we'll move away from that. Um, it says, uh, the question is, on another level, and this is from Pierre DeVries, who's a long time, uh, long time ICLW speaker and, and um, experienced researcher, are you talking primarily about improving education? How much is improving education versus how much is roboticizing it? So there's, a, there's the question from Peter. So how much is improving versus roboticizing? Well, so I think the word roboticizing, I mean, that, that, that's a, that sounds like a pretty laden word. Um, I, I would mentally envision that word as meaning automatizing, removing the human element, removing the quality, removing the individualization. And what I would say is that my goal is the exact opposite of doing that. Um, a lot of e-learning in the corporate world, let's be really honest, is of the nature of watch this video, answer this list of multiple choice questions. And that to me is robotic and boring. The idea here is to create rich learning experiences and capture the data from them to either make the experience more adaptive in itself or to empower a human with information that they can take action on. So when I showed that example earlier 
of the, uh, the system that realizes there's something going wrong, messages the instructor, queues up an email for the instructor to send that the instructor can edit. That's an attempt to really empower the instructor to do something. And uh, I could have given the, the K-12 example of assessments, which gives really rich data to instructors that they use to change their teaching day to day. Um, I also think that a system like DeFalco's, which realizes the learner's becoming frustrated and um, tries to give them a message to try to help reinforce their identity as a way of sticking with it. I mean, it's true in a sense it's canned, but I suspect that a traditional corporate training course or a traditional course, if that learner was learning that same first aid, first response skill in a traditional learning setting with a human instructor, the odds that the human instructor would be watching each one of them to see if they felt frustrated and then adapting to it and giving those students who felt frustrated a social identity message, but not bothering the other ones. That's pretty unlikely. So to me, the whole idea here is to increase the sensitivity and the richness of the experience, not to uh, make it feel more robotic. Yeah, and, then, and there's something to that. I mean, if, you know, even in my, my little demo that I did before you spoke, um, that you know, if we do this right, AI and anything that, that sort of involves robots in any form, and I'll we'll refer to robots in one of the later talks, is you know, makes people feel less robotic, right? Like the robots can be robotic, the people should be less robotic. And traditional mass education as it's evolved is, as you said, very much robotic. There's way too much, you know, in order to do things on a large scale in person is kind of how this evolved. Things that are memorized, test, take a quiz, answer the questions, pick from the following options, fill out your little bubbles on the street so that it can be automatically scanned on a large scale and, and graded. And none of that really helps people learn. Using AI in the right ways, as we're talking about here with big data and with the kind of examples that you showed um, I was talking about earlier, can get us to the kind of rich experiences that we want. I think that's absolutely the, um, you know, the sort of, you know, the goal to me is technology is to humanize the experience, which which sounds, you know, sounds counterintuitive in a sense, but is actually I think that is a, I think the right thing. The human experiences tend to way too often, and there are obviously exceptions and great exceptions. Um, but too often, especially when you're dealing with a large scale audience, tend to be too robotic. I think that's exactly right. Um, <laughs> moving on, next question. Yeah, next we'll next question we come um, from Renee Hobbs, one of our speakers. What um, what efforts, I guess, if any, are underway to? We talked before about decision makers having trouble really being able to, you know, <clears throat> separate the um, snake oil salesman from those who are not snake oil salesmen. Um, are there any efforts that you're aware of, or any things that we could come up with to? educate people to help make better decisions and, and help them understand, and she also writes that the power and limitations of the tools. So I think this is, her question is, what can help people decide, understand the power of limitations in the tools? And I think to me that also gets back to what's, you know, what's really helpful, what's not really helpful, how do you know? Yeah. So I'm sorry to go back to K-12 so often, but it is the space that I think we can learn from as an analogy here, because it's the one that's gone the furthest. Um, in K-12 in the United States, and this really is a much more, to my knowledge, American phenomenon than worldwide. There are two large databases that compete with each other to uh, provide summaries on the effectiveness and quality of systems. There's the What Works Clearinghouse from the US government, and there's the Evidence for ESSA from the University of Maryland. And these two initiatives are really trying to come up with rigorous standards, apply them, check the evidence. There's nothing like that in any other sector of education and it's expensive to create such an initiative. What I've done is at least try to, in my massive online open course, educate people on the potential of these kind of methods, which by the way, there's two issues, the quality of technology, which is more of a statistical thing, and the quality of analytics, which is more of the kind of space I'm in. But I think that initiatives to kind of promote to people what they should be looking for um, are really valuable. I am doing that in my own small way. I don't know of specific initiatives in e-learning to kind of incorporate e-learning to kind of create standards for what kind of evidence people should be seeing. Um, if they are, I've just missed it. But I do think that uh, the K-12 example provides some illustrations. If one were to start such an initiative, there would be, though I, dis though I disagree with some aspects of how they set things up, there would not be a better place to start than the evidence for ESSA evidence standards. Let me ask one follow up to that. If um... Just to sort of get your thought on, on this, are there any tips and sort of suggestions you can give people if they're in this situation where they might be asked to make this decision, right? So suppose suppose somebody walks into the room, thought experiment may or may not be a snake oil salesman. What? How would you in this field? How would are there some things that you might want to 
ask about or specifically focus on to try to get a better feel for how, you know, how legit this person is. Do you have an experiment or a quasi experiment showing that your system works better than business as usual? Um, where's the data? You pro it probably hasn't been published, but do you have a white paper? Can I look at the white paper? Can I look at what your measures were? Um, if you're using some sort of adaptive learning system, have you published on that? What algorithm are you using? Um, is it an algorithm that has publications on it in a conference or a journal like educational data mining, learning analytics and knowledge, or artificial intelligence and education? Um, if somebody's using an algorithm that's never been published in one of those three, I'm really suspicious of it. Um, if they can't tell you what their algorithm is, or they say, oh, it's proprietary. In this space, nobody should be using an algorithm that's that proprietary. Maybe they won't be showing you the deep internals of their model, in part because some of those models are hard to understand anyways, but they should be able to tell you what model they used, what its goodness metrics were, what the evidence for efficacy is. I'd be glad to chat with anybody who's making that decision and help them evaluate this because there are certain tells that I feel like a scientist like me can see in 15 minutes that kind of tell you what space it's in. Yeah, that's exactly. That's kind of what I was trying to get at. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you can do this in 15 minutes. How can you teach someone else to do this in, you know, in an hour yeah. at any rate or, or something close to that? No, that's great. That's really, really helpful. Um, the next question is, I don't know if there's an answer to this necessarily. Um, I'm not aware of one. Is there a library of big data education models that's out there that might be useful for, for people to refer to? Uh, there's no library. The number of different models and approaches is just ginormous. Um, I mean, my massive online open course is, is an attempt to create a uh, <clears throat> almost a curated resource that teaches about the most important types of model. Um, and I would encourage folks to start there. <clears throat> uh, also a couple of papers on my website. Uh, my literature review with George Siemens from 2014 is a stab at that, as well as my literature review uh, with Paul Inventado from, I think, 2017. So those are not terrible places to start. Um, they're not going to capture everything, and especially uh, these days there are literally tens of thousands of different machine learning models and approaches and paradigms. Oh, that's, quite, that's, quite, that's quite a number. All right, be, it would be, uh, be quite a library. Um, all right, st next question is about uh, sort of transparency. So um, kind of just go through the, the Renee's question. Um, you know, mentions that the field of educational data mining is affected by the large number of academics who do consulting work for corporations um, where they cannot share what they learn with the academic research community, which is what you mentioned, um, and I've seen in other areas as well. Um, Renee, one of our speakers, mentions that scholars in chemistry, biology, and other fields have struggled to ensure that knowledge produced by funded research still becomes available for the knowledge community, and so that's a challenge other fields face as well, and I think we see it in, in e-learning as a, as a whole, at least in, within the workplace. What efforts that you know of, are there any efforts that are happening to ensure that data mining and education can be transparent to research and policymakers and that things can be made available? Is there anything you know of that's, uh, that's happening at this point to, to further that? Well, I, I think to me, actually, the issue of transparency and the issue of broader sharing, it's complicated because I, I think that when I think of transparency, I think that, for example, if I publish a paper with that's funded by industrial money, I should acknowledge that fact. And typically I do. Typically, if I do publish such a paper, the, at the I won't say typically, in every situation I can think of where I've been funded with corporate money to do research that involves corporate work, uh, the corporation has been explicitly named and uh, has been co-authored. I'm not, uh, I, I, I hate saying never and always because I'll find some special case somewhere that I'm not thinking of, but I make a great effort to acknowledge I'm not, if I'm going to write an efficacy report saying that McGraw-Hill stuff passed an efficacy test that I was part of, McGraw-Hill is going to be named as the co-authors, you know, if I do that with um, another company. So I think that's one aspect of transparency is acknowledging funding. The other one is reporting on findings. And that I think is, is complicated because you can do a lot to improve a product that may not be something that the, that the company wants to report that they did, um, or wants to talk, report that they talk, wants to talk about. So for example, take a system, and I have worked in these cases, take a system that the data logging was bad and the system wasn't effective. And I worked with them to improve their data logging, make the system more effective, and we now have evidence that's better. The company might not want me to actually report on how their system used to be awful. 
and now it's not so awful anymore. They might want to uh, talk about the results at the end. So those things that we learn in process, then I have to have kind of a conversation with the company on what process do we want to share? What parts of that process do we want to share? Is it possible for me to take what I learned here? Are you okay with me using that in other academic systems and transferring that knowledge back to my more academic work? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Um, if we're going to partner with people, we have to partner on terms that both sides find reasonable. And I certainly wouldn't suppress results suggesting a system's bad um, in order because my because my client wants that. That there's ethical issues around that. But should I report every aspect of the process and everything we learn about the methods through the process? That's complicated. And uh, certainly anybody who was told anything bad I learned from your system in the process of working on it, even if we fix it, I'm gonna tell the world about, that would, they would not be very interested in partnering together. And the end result would be less progress and less improvement. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, that makes that make, makes a lot of sense. Let me let me ask it one one question. We have a little bit of time left. Um, I want to get back to one thing that you said earlier. You talked about using data to get a feel for people's um, emotional sense and whether they're you know in in the flow and the you know in the in the scientific sense of flow. Can you speak a little bit more about you know how? You know what? How you how you're able to do that sort of a conceptual level? What you know what what kinds of indicators you might be able to use if you're you know automatically watching someone involved in an experience and then you're able to to glean from that you know whether they're in the flow is it you know is it all speed is it you know all that and, and are the environments designed specifically for that or is it more that your algorithms are able to kind of watch people in different environments? <clears throat> That's a great question. First of all, when it comes to emotion, the contingent behaviors associated with emotion are very different in different environments. Um, for, dis for disengaged behavior in general, some disengaged behaviors like gaming the system, you can actually make a model that works in multiple environments. Emotion is much more contingent. But for example, it might have to do with the, the dynamics and regularity of action. Students who are deep in deeply engaged tend to work in a more rhythmic fashion. And they also actually tend to fidget in a more rhythmic fashion as well. So when you have posture centric tears, you see the same thing. So people who are deeply engaged tend to be working, they tend to be making progress. They may not always get things right, but they're making progress. They tend to work in a more rhythmic fashion. Um, and in many ways, they just look different than people who are bored, who have long unexplained pauses that don't seem to be associated with struggle with the activity, or people who are frustrated, who seem to have lots of pauses after doing poorly. And, um, and who possibly ask for help or change activities when they really start to struggle. So um, it really comes down to interpreting the behaviors that are associated with emotion can often be difficult, which is why we need ground truth, because it's a priori hard for a human being to look at a, a, a log trace and say, yes, this student's engaged, or yes, this student is, is, is bored. But if you can have a person out in the field watching them or get self-report, that then gives you an anchor to be able to catch the behaviors. Our models of emotion still aren't great. A lot of the other ones we've been talking about are, um, are getting up into being able to recognize the kind of constructs we're talking about 85, 92% of the time. And our best emotion models are still in the 70s and in some cases still down to the, the 60s. So good enough that they can be used in an aggregate and with fail soft interventions, like a message, not good enough that we can really say, yes, this learner right now is frustrated. And I would imagine then the goal is, is not only to recognize that the learner is frustrated, but as things continue to advance, to be able to decide what to do about it in a way that's suitable for that learner, right? So there may be times where it's, okay, this is simply a boring course. There's the, the problem is it's boring for everybody, but sometimes it's not hitting their interest. It's something maybe that they already knew. It's something that they would care about mm -hmm. if you positioned it differently. There are all sorts of ways that you could go about it. They're in a, a, an uncomfortable situation, so they've lost interest because of, <clears throat> of something sort of peripherally related. So I imagine as things progress, I don't know how much we're able to get to that now, but those would be all things that we'd want to be able to get to and use and start yeah. to take that emotion and figure out on an individual level um, what we can do about it. Affective science, uh, the science of emotion, is still at its very beginnings. Um, we are, as a field, still struggling with, um, in the 1960s and 1970s, some inadvertently bad science was done. Um, and I mean methodologically bad, the people were perfectly well-meaning, uh, that, that added 
incorrect knowledge to the common understanding. So um, you actually, the, the, the incorrect work done in the 60s and 70s is today's pop culture understanding of emotion. And we're still trying to get past that. And there's still some very basic questions about how does emotion interact with behavior? What drives emotion? How does it relate to, mo uh, to motivation and interest? Um, that we're still answering before we can really develop a system that responds differently to different types of boredom in different contexts. Well, thanks so much. Um, time for one, one last question in the chat, if we have anything. I think we've kind of gone, gone through them and are really just about at the, uh, at the end of the time. And uh, so let me wrap up. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for spending the morning with us. Uh, obviously, we, we'll, we'll see you checking in when you have a chance over the next three days. Um, and it's been great to talk with you as always. So really, thanks, thanks once again. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me, uh, David, and all the organizers. And I look forward to future conversations. Absolutely. With folks. Thanks, Thanks again, Raj. Much.